we the department of english in association with iqsc and women's cell of prashanta chandra mahalanobesh mahavidyalay have organized an international webinar on girl interrupted trauma and emancipation of women i would like to invite our head of department of english dr shukanto dash to introduce the speaker over to you dr dash thank you very much good morning to one and all our coordinator iqsc dr komala mitra ma'am convener women cell dr alpona rai and most importantly our guest speaker in this session professor sitra mukherjee department of english west bengal state university on behalf of the department of english prashant chandra mohananobish mahavidyalay i welcome you all once again to this webinar and you probably know that we have three speakers in this particular webinar in three different time period now it's a matter of joy for us to host these eminent speakers who will be talking on different issues regarding uh, gender sensitization women's issues the politics as well as the poetics of women and gender studies at the very outset i may inform you that uh, there may be certain technical issues or uh, you know problems that may be beyond our control but you all know that we are more or less now habituated with this kind of uh, technical glitches that we encounter here and we also believe that you will cooperate with us in conducting this webinar so at the very outset i once again therefore appreciate your patience and look forward to your cooperation i may just inform you that we are extremely pleased and overwhelmed with your responses more than 500 uh, you know teachers students and scholars have got themselves registered for this webinar so it's a matter of joy and pride for us to get this kind of support from you all as you know that the ugc has in its recent you know instruction has asked the colleges and universities to conduct various programs on women issues and we have therefore started thinking on that and then this particular program is a kind of call to ugc and at the same time we may inform you that our department has been closely working with the women cell of our college to help our students get themselves you know get themselves uh, sensitized about the different issues regarding women now we all are eagerly waiting for uh, listening to the kind of electrifying speech that our guest speakers will be delivering very shortly i therefore on part of the on behalf of the department of english wish you all the best and we look forward to your cooperation and i always believe that the kind of interaction that and the questions that may be raised by the kind of the webinars that we are all organizing will help us to look at these different issues that are being talked about now interestingly the very 
titles, the topics that our guest speakers have actually chosen for delivering here are multidimensional and have immediate implications. So therefore, without you know, taking much time here because of the technical problems and all that, uh, let us all you know, welcome our speaker, Professor Sikra Mukherjee, and we'll be extremely you know, pleased to have the kind of conversation. As we all know that a, the success of a webinar depends more importantly not on the answers that you know, a speaker or the person concerned provides, but the kind of questions that the webinar actually you know, provokes. So we are all looking forward to a very intellectually provocative and stimulating interaction and, and conversation. So thank you very much. Now over to you, Isha. Thank you. I would request uh, Dr. Kamala Mitra, our IQAC coordinator, to say a few words as a welcome actress. Over to you, Dr. Mitra. Great morning, everyone. On behalf of Honorable Principal, IQAC, and Omen Cell of our college, and the organizing department, I, the coordinator of IQAC, have the privilege to welcome the distinguished speakers and all the enthusiastic participants of our international webinar titled Girl Interrupted Trauma and Emancipation of Women. I feel overwhelmed that we have been able to organize a webinar on such a topic that can develop sensitization to a genuinely sensitive issue of our society. I am sure that all the participants are going to love our webinar containing three sessions as we're going to be enriched with the thoughts and eloquence of our three outstanding speakers today. Thank you all. Let us now begin the session. Thank you, Angona. Thank you, Dr. Mitra. Um, I would now take the privilege of welcoming Dr. Shipra Mukherjee, Professor, Department of English, West Bengal State University. Her research interests are religion, caste, power, and folk literature, and she has authored various books, literary context series, Modern English Literature, 1890 to 1960, she has been the editor of the Languages of Religion, exploring the politics of the sacred, co-edited the Calcutta Mosaic, the minority communities of Calcutta, and time chart of events and publications of the 20th century. Her research works on marginal literature, religion, and social linguistics in East India has been published in several peer-reviewed books and journals. I would now request Dr. Shipra Mukherjee to begin her lecture. Over to you, Dr. Mukherjee. Thank you, Isha. My thanks to the college, Prashanta Chandra Mahalanobish authorities, to the IQAC cell, and to the faculty of the English department, to the head, Professor Shukanto, to the other faculty, and to my two students who are working there, Orko and Chandrama. I'm indeed impressed that you could put together such a good, interesting webinar at such very, very short notice. Uh, I will try to keep to the brief that Chandrama has given me, which was the importance of gender sensitization among students to build awareness about violence and gender discrimination. I will try to keep to this brief, and therefore my uh, words today will largely be targeted towards the students 
uh, more than scholars, though I do notice there are some of my colleagues who are here uh, as uh, uh, in the audience, but I will largely be addressing students here in uh, trying to help them understand the concepts of gender sensitization, the need for gender sensitization at Chandrama, as Chandrama had told me, and the concepts of gender violence. Uh, before I begin properly on my lecture, can you tell me if I am audible clearly? Yes, yes definitely, ma'am. Ma Thank You're you audible. so much, Isha. Okay, now I gave in the title of my uh, uh, talk today at a fairly late, uh, on a fairly late date. And so let me share the topic with you on the screen. This is the title of my talk today. You had said girl interrupted. So I thought I would borrow from you and make it girl imagined, pushing the boundaries of the imagined community. So this is what I am going to talk about, the concepts of girl and the concept of imagination, the imaginary of the girl, so to say. I will stop share now, but we will of course be going back to it, uh, to some more pictures which I have to Sure. Now, when Chandrama sent me this, this uh, not title, but this brief, that is, which she gave me upon which she wanted me to talk, the importance of gender sensitization among students to build awareness about violence and gender discrimination. Now, the first thing that struck me as I read these words was the apparent absurdity of this sentence, which we have come to take as a normal sentence, as a rational sentence. If you look at the sentence, the importance of gender sensitization. So I went to the dictionary to look up what is the meaning of sensitization to find that the dictionary says it is the quality or condition of responding to certain stimuli in a sensitive manner. In other words, when we talk of sensitization, we are talking of the ability to respond with our senses to certain stimulus or stimuli that are there in our realities around us. That does seem a little strange, doesn't it? Because say, for example, you walk down the road and you see an accidental fire. Does anybody have to sensitize you to what needs to be done? Not really. Your common sense tells you either you need to run or you need to try to douse the fire or you need to raise the alarm. There is really no necessity for any special sensitization. So why does then the phrase gender sensitization or why has the phrase gender sensitization come to mean something which to us is perfectly normal, perfectly desirable, something that we really need to do in our schools, colleges, offices, everywhere, the police academies. Why this need to sensitize us to the gender? Now, the, root, the hint for this obviously lies in that word which qualifies sensitization, gender sensitization. We perhaps don't need any training to be sensitized, any training to know how to react to the accidental fire, but we do need a certain kind of training at a certain kind of sensitization to aspects of gender. And when you think of it in that way, you immediately realize that there is some problem that we are saying lies in the word gender. Right? There are possibly some unspoken layers in the words. There are some kinds of veils which, uh, uh, which sort of hide or disguise maybe the reality of what is happening from our eyes. And it is because of that, that when we look at certain events that involve gender, or when we hear of certain events that involve gender, we 
do not always see what commonsensically we would have otherwise seen with our rationality, with our intelligence. We usually know how to react to realities happening around us. But in the case of gender, decades of work, centuries in fact, if we begin with Mary Wollstonecraft, of work, of study has told us, have told us that gender is an area which has been so layered with different kinds of pseudo realities, of pseudo understandings, that a certain kind of sensitization, a certain training on how to react is required if our responses and reactions are to be intelligent, rational, commonsensical. Okay? So that was the first part of what she told me, the importance of gender sensitization, she said, among students, so I'm going to target this largely towards students, to build awareness about violence and gender discrimination. That is, the violence that we usually see on the roads strike us as a reality of violence. But when we are talking of gender violence, we very often do not recognize it as violence. When we talk of, when we see discrimination, we very often do not recognize it as discrimination. What really has happened, therefore? Reality or realities over cultures over the centuries have dulled our senses, our, have blunted our intelligences in certain ways so that we cannot react or respond or see what we would otherwise have seen. The endeavor over the past decades has been to gradually peel away these layers of artificial veils, of artificial pseudo-realities, so that the true reality which lies at the core of these incidents of violence and discrimination can be easily seen and recognized in the same way that we would see and recognize an accidental fire, can be seen and recognized by all of us so that the violence and the discrimination gets addressed. When we talk of this complex package, so to say, of the gender, we are, of course, going back what Simone de Beauvoir so famously had said many, many years ago, the gender is not natural. We are not born women, she said, we become women. Gender then is a culturally contingent aspect of existence. If I belong to this geographical territory of the East, I understand my gender identity in a certain way. If I belong to that geographically specific locale of the North, I understand my gender identity in a certain way. In fact, as our theorists have told us, Kate Millett famously with her sexual politics, that the understanding of gender is not just different from geographical space to geographical space, but the understanding of, ge de of gender becomes different within the very same geographical space in accordance with my class, in accordance with my caste, if you come to South Asia, in accordance with my education. So there are these different kinds of facets which have gone into the making of our gender identities. So we are made into women. In fact, since we are we have already had Judith Butler. We no longer think of the gender studies as women's studies. We think of gender studies as both studies of the feminine as well as studies of the masculine. And therefore there is an increasingly growing arena of masculinity studies. Because as gender said, let me quote this for you. She, she gave this lie to the stereotypes of gender very, very succinctly. She said, there is no gender identity. 
behind the expressions of gender. Our identity, she says, is performatively constituted by the very expressions that are said to be its results. To break it down further in more simpler language, there is no gender identity behind the expression of my gender. When I talk in a certain way, supposedly, allegedly feminine way, it is an expression of my gender. However, there is no deeper core reality lying beneath it. When I'm angry and I talk in a certain way, that expression of my anger is the expression of a reality of a feeling that I'm feeling inside. However, Butler is saying that the expression is all there is to the gender. The way you say it, the way you behave, the way you not just talk and behave and gesture, but also the way you think, the way you believe what your duties are, are all have all been brought into you, these expressions of your identity, because of your understanding of your gender, whether it is the masculine gender or whether it is the feminine gender. So in a situation of crisis, a female expresses her gender in a certain way, a male is supposed to express his, his gender in a different way. And that is what Butler is saying when she says, identity is performatively constituted by the very expressions that are said to be its results. We usually say that it is because she is or he is a man that he's behaving like that. Butler is saying that's not it. He is behaving like that because he has been taught to behave like that. In other words, the core that we are moving into is the core of the human being. The ideas of gender, and this of course is coming down to us from the time of uh, Simone de Beauvoir, that the ideas of gender are all what the social, the society, the culture has imposed upon us. It is not necessarily the core of my being. And therefore increasingly these days, we talk of the, the feminine genders of, of a, which are desirable in a man, kindness, mercy, gentleness, right? We, 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 in, we have increasingly come to value these qualities in males, just as we expect the females also to have masculine qualities, efficiency, punctuality, hard work, all of these which were earlier considered to be aspects of the public sphere and therefore aspects of the male personality are today expected from females also. With Butler's books, whether it is Gender Trouble or her uh, later books, there has been therefore a deeper understanding of the idea of gender, a better understanding, a, a clearer understanding. And we are trying to strip away the, 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 the many, many layers, peel away the layers. It's like taking an onion and gradually peeling away the layers to get to that small white core, which is hidden, the reality that is there in the idea of gender. Now, when we do, when we try to do this, what we are really then talking of is something which has taken the 20th century, definitely, the late 20th century and then 21st century now by storm. And that is the idea of the imaginary, which is why I had, I, uh, 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 just a minute. Yes, which is why I had, uh, I, I titled the talk, Girl Imagined, because much of what the girl does or the boy does for that matter, is in accordance with a certain imaginary. If you look at the scholarship that uh, is present in uh, the sphere, the modern spheres of the humanities and the social sciences, you will find it fairly bristles with the idea of the imaginary. And we are unpacking not just the package of the feminine, also the masculine, the idea of the nation. Remember, Benedict Anderson's book, The Imagined Community, trying to understand what or how we conjured, we created the nation. The imaginary of religion is repeatedly being spoken about. What is this idea of religion that all of us think of as so great, so true, so big? It is after all, like gender, 
something which man has created. Everything that man has created is artificial, right? Whenever, when you talk of something as natural, you mean it is something which nature has made. Something which nature has made, and when you say natural, you imply that this is something which is natural and therefore cannot be messed with. You cannot change it. If nature says you're going to be hungry, you're going to be hungry, you're going to need food, you're not going to need sleep, you're going to die otherwise. So the idea of the natural is something that is not made by man, that is made by the far, far, far more powerful uh, 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 persona of nature, something which we are understanding now, all of us locked in our own rooms and doing a webinar with technology. So nature, when we say something is natural, it is something which is beyond our control. When something is man-made, we say it is artificial and therefore we say if man can make it, man can unmake it. It can be deconstructed, it can be destroyed and rebuilt once again. And repeatedly we have seen sh scholarship show us over the years how things have been made, destroyed, rebuilt once again in accordance with the needs of the times. So what we are talking of today here is also the girl imagined. What is this imaginary? What is this, this idea of the imagination which defines for us an identity which we think we have no control over because it is natural, okay? Now, let us borrow a little from Benedict Anderson's book, Imagined Communities. In Imagined Communities, this is what he says, and I thought this was a very, very telling statement uh, which could be brought to bear upon the understandings of gender. New and old, he says, are aligned diachronically. And the former, new, appears always to invoke an ambiguous blessing from the dead. It is perhaps then understandable that all these many titles that have come about on the concept of the imagined or the imaginary, all of these are dealing with man-made constructs, religion, nation, identity, society, community, all of these are dealing with man-made constructs which are not totally new, totally modern, so to say, nor are they totally old. Though we think of the nation as something that has always existed with us, that is not true. If you read up on all the, scholar, the studies that have been made of the nation, Partha Chatterjee's books, Anderson's books, you will find that the nation for us Indians at least, and also for uh, Europeans, was made somewhere around the 18th, 19th century. For us, it was made around the 19th century. Fairly recent, therefore, right? However, when this concept of gender or nation or community, whatever you say, this concept was made, nobody spoke of it as something which is new, as something that we are inventing and making. They always spoke of it as something that had existed with us, that has always been there with us. We are only now beginning to give it a definite shape. Right? That is what we, we said when we constructed our Indian nation, that Bharat Borsho has always been a reality. Today we are only writing of Bharat Borsho as a nation because we are all in a colonized space and therefore we talk of, we think of all of ourselves as the same, as part of India. However, if you look back to our old songs, you will find the praise is not so much for Bharat Varsho. The praise is for Bangla, because that was our nation. That was our country. That was our desh. We knew very little about Rajasthan or Gujarat or the south of India or the north of India. In order for us to be able to understand the entirety as one construct, Avon Indranath Thakur starts writing Raj Kahini, stories of Rajasthan, etc., Rajputs, who are of ours, as he says. What, is, what then am I trying to say? What I'm trying to tell you is that though these constructs, whether it is of gender, nation, community, religion, whatever, though they may be new constructs, 
they are constructs which are made at a certain point of time. But despite this, when they make it, the makers of that, com of that construct do not tell you or do not even think themselves that this is something new. What they do is what Anderson is saying, that they fuse the old and the new together. And the new is always, as it were, turning to the old and sort of seeking blessings from it. So aligning itself with the old. Let's try to put this into our understanding of gender now. Okay? What you understanding of the woman today, you young women in your late 19, teens or your early 20s, you unthink of yourselves as modern women. But the moment you think of the concept of woman, modern women, you will find you are talking of very new things, very new aspects, very new facets of your personality. At the same time, however, you are also talking of old aspects, facets which you have heard your grandparents talk of, facets which Gandhi had put in during the time of when he was writing about the role of the women in the nationalist movement, the idea of gentleness, the idea of mercy, all of these sort of come together. So there is a blending of the new and the old. And in this blending of the new and the old, with this blending of the new and the old, we have what we today consider our concept of the woman, of the girl. It is therefore a girl that is imagined. If you go back to your grandmother's time, her concept of girl would have been her new and her old. Your concept of woman is your new and your grandmother's old. So what is happening then? The concept of gender then is constantly changing. It is not something which is constant. It is not something which remains unchanged, carved in stone. It is something which we constantly change in accordance with our needs. But we cannot entirely change it and make it of the new because then it would lose its validation. It is, as you say, when you are sometimes challenged about something, why are you doing this? And you say, well, this is how it has been done since ages. You are seeking validation from the old age, from the olden times. You're not saying this is right or wrong. You're just saying this is how it has been. Similarly, these concepts, which are so important to our society, our communities, our worlds, here too, the concept of gender or the concepts of gender, be it masculine or feminine, have to have a lot of the old remaining in it. And of course, they take in more and more from the new, because otherwise, if the concept remained entirely old, the concept would have crashed. It would have become irrelevant. It would not have had any meaning, so to say. Okay? All right. Now, for those who came in late, uh, just uh, 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 an explanation which I gave at the beginning of the talk, that my talk today uh, is largely targeted at students. And therefore, I'm trying to, going to try to unpack the imaginary of gender, the imagined gender, so to say, to paraphrase uh, Benedict Anderson's imagined communities. Now, in this, what we find is the collective memory, therefore, becomes important, right? What I believe, what you believe, we all have our personal spaces. We all have our personal experiences and therefore our personal memories. But when we talk of these concepts, we are not just talking of our personal experiences. So my personal experience, if it is different from that of yours and of many others, will become an exception. It will not add to the collective memory. Okay. Obviously, when I talk of collective memory, I'm talking of what Carl Jung in 1925 spoke of as the collective unconscious. Okay. Now, I think I have, I had uh, brought in the quotation of the collective unconscious. Let me just read that out to you. Yes, I think this is it. This is Carl Jung saying, my thesis then is as follows. In addition to our immediate consciousness, which is of a thoroughly personal nature, 
and which we believe to be the only empirical psyche, emp empirical, something which I can experiment, something which I know from my senses, from my first-hand senses. Even if we tack on the personal unconscious, which Freud spoke of as an appendix, there exists a second psychic system of a collective, universal, and impersonal nature, which is identical in all individuals. This collective unconscious does not develop individually, but is inherited. It consists of pre-existent forms, the archetypes, which can only become conscious secondarily and which give definite form to certain psychic contents. This is what we talk of or what we understand when we find an infant who has no memory of the fears of the dark being scared by darkness. When this is the explanation that we give when we find an infant who has no knowledge of music, when he or she feels happy when there is cheerful music being played. What is this? This person is somebody who doesn't know anything of music, happy, unhappy, whatever. Carl Jung says, this is the collective unconscious that we are all born with. If you look at Amitabh Ghosh's essay, The Imam and the Indian, in his collection of essays, The Imam and the Indian, uh, taken from the book in an antique land, where he is talking of uh, his experiences uh, when he was a research scholar in, uh, in Egypt, a largely Muslim gathering. And he says, they are asking me on my religion. And they are laughing at me. You, you, you uh, worship the cow? Uh, you do this? You do that? You're not circumcised? And Amitabh Ghosh says, he's a young uh, scholar at that time. He says, I can understand. They are just, it's just a lighthearted discussion. But I cannot keep away from me the feeling of uneasiness and the feeling of fear that this talk of religion is immediately bringing into me. This, this uneasiness that I am different, that they are Muslims and I am Hindu. Where does this uneasiness or this fear in Amitabh Ghosh come from? Amitabh Ghosh is obviously referring to what he himself has faced when he was a child. What, or even if he has not consciously faced this legacy that we all carry with us about the memories of communal riots so that whenever there is a, the word riot is used we are immediately anxious and we never think of riot as anything other than communal riots right so that is the unconscious the collective memory of us south asians of us indians who have read and heard and possibly experienced so much in our histories that the word riot always to us will mean communal rights. So in this way, the collective unconscious becomes part of our identities. The idea, why, the reason why I move so much into the collective unconscious is because much of your understanding of gender is from this imagined, imaginary, the collective unconscious. Let me move a little bit now into my into the some some few pictures which i have uh which i have uh, got for you and where i am going into this uh i'm using um, um a case study see these are when it, you, you cannot talk of these as abstract theories right we understand gender through experiences through examples so I'm going to take you into a case study, which I'm taking from Urvashi Butalia's book, Partish on, uh, Partish on the Other Side of Silence. And I'm going to try to uh, uh, explain it through there. Okay, let me put this full screen. Butalia over here is talking about the question of the returning women who had been abducted by the Pakistanis. And, uh, she is taking a, doing, doing a lot of field work, taking interviews, and so saying, at one point in one of the interviews uh, that she takes, this person, uh, she, she documents this interview, and this person is saying, if there is any sore point or distressful fact to which we cannot be reconciled under any circumstances, it is the question of the abduction and non-restoration of Hindu women. 
we all know our history of what happened in the time of Sri Ram when Sheeta was abducted. Here, when thousands of girls are concerned, we cannot forget this. This is uh, a member of parliament talking in parliament. We can forget all the properties. We can forget every other thing, but this cannot be forgotten. As descendants of Ram, we have to bring back every Sheeta that is alive. The imaginary, the shared imaginary of the male, the descendants of Ram, okay? So the, the gender, the, the, the boy imagined would then be Ram imagined. So the boy, when you are imagining your gender, you are not entirely independent or free to imagine yourself. You have all these legacies or baggages, whether you want it or not, on your back. As descendants of Ram, we have to bring back every Sheeta that is alive. The girl imagined, therefore, is imagined as Sheeta. She is, Sheeta, as all of us know, was more a passive victim. We do not really see her except right at the end when she decides she's had enough, enough is enough, and she decides to kill herself. Apart from that, Sheeta is always seen as a victim. So there is, therefore, this concept of the victimhood, the victim, in the understanding of the girls who were abducted uh, uh, at the time of partition. Uh, if you read through these uh, works that we have on the partition, whether it is the partition of the West or on the Western border or it is the partition on the Eastern border, you will find not a single family ever refers to uh, the, the, uh, the women of their own family being abducted or raped or violated in any way. The, there is not a single reference to the first person. It is always the third person, a family we heard of, a family in our village. It is never, and therefore the interviewers, uh, all of whom, Shurupa Gupto, uh, all of these people who have worked on the partition say, where are the families to whom it happened? Obviously, everybody cannot be speaking the truth. It is just that even when it happens in my family, I want to distance it. I do not want to see that identity of a violated Sheeta being part of my family. Many uh, uh, scholars who've worked along the Punjab border are today speaking of women who were abducted. If you look at the, uh, the works of Krishna Sobhati, for example, women who were abducted or women who were who found shelter, who were given shelter in a, in a home or in a family, finally marrying into that family and leading happy lives. Uh, not all men and not all women, not all men uh, are bad, right? So there were some who were human enough to give shelter or some families who helped. And we, in fact, much of this, the, the partition would have been a a total tale of destruction if it had not been for so many families, so many Muslims, so many Hindus who protected, who sheltered people whom they knew and carefully took them across the border. But the tales of these Sheetas who decided that they may as well stay back there, that they were happy there, that the people there were not bad. These, the tales of these Sheetas cannot be fit into the imaginary that we have, the imaginary of our Sheeta, or even the imaginary of women. And therefore, these stories have always been left out of the imaginary. They've been left out of the documentation. Gauri Vishwanathan, I think, if I'm not mistaken, is talking about, uh, in her, I think it is in the book Outside the Fold, she is talking about one, uh, uh, or maybe it's not Gauri Vishwanathan, I don't remember. She's talking about a, a, a one woman who is talking of another woman that she married there and she did well, meaning that she is happy. She took the right decision. If there was a decision, because as we know, there was little choice, right? But these, because these are stories that cannot be fit into the imaginary, these stories therefore are always left out. What we are trying to do as we study gender, as we try to unpack the imaginary of gender, therefore, is try to understand how we can change the delineations 
of these imaginaries in order to take in the realities which are also there as part of this imaginary that a man can be moved to tears that a woman can be far more physically strong than a man very common has proved that these are also our realities and if we do not bring them into the imaginary we are not sensitized to the reality of what is happening in, around us in order for gender sensitization therefore we need to push the boundaries we need to push the envelope we need to push the boundaries so as to take or take in other realities which are as true as the realities which are already part of the gender uh, okay now how do i go to the next slide okay this is this is um, no i think we'll just skip these because we don't have so much time um okay uh this is the testimony of uh, Bir Bahadur Singh this is from Urvash Badalia's book Basant Kaur's son and he gives you a very very detailed uh description of uh, women who killed themselves by jumping into the well can you check your phone just one minute can you check your phone the message from Mr. Anwar said my husband Sir, right. Uh, you know what was I saying? Yes, he gives you a detailed description of uh, these women uh, who were cornered, who were surrounded, and knew that they had no uh, no way, uh, no hope of escaping, and so they decided to kill themselves by jumping into a well. Now, they jump into the well, right, one after the other, and after quite a few jump in, the well fills up. Okay, and when the well fills up. there was this woman who jumped into the well four times but there was no water in the well there was not even any place for her in the well any more to go down to fall down so to say and so she jumped in four times and she came up again four times and she did not die now when butalia takes this interview and uh, bir bahadur singh uh, gives this, this these details of this woman who jumped in four times and who had to climb out again because she did not die when though she jumped into the well he does not say that this woman that he is talking to is his mother basant kaur it is only later that urvashi butalia comes to know that bir bahadur singh had been talking of his mother but bir bahadur singh's words did not at the time of the interview convey any feeling of happiness or identify the woman as mother that this mother of his was alive post partition rather he distanced her by refusing to acknowledge her as his mother he distanced her talking of her as that woman on the other hand in the same interview she finds let me see if i have that she finds veer bahadur singh uh, talking of this is uh, that part of the interview talking of in detail how a woman killed herself by taking poison and the way it is written if you see she told us kill me i will not survive i have a child in my womb she was wounded in the stomach etc etc she tries she, she basically commits suicide and then she calls for afim and then we in a ladle we mixed opium with saliva she said the holy mantra and then uh she had this poison and very gradually and as uh, bir bahadur singh details the death you can see the pride that he feels in this woman who decided to kill herself rather than be dishonored what i'm trying to tell you therefore is that the imaginary of both women and men but here we are talking largely of the, we are talking of the women the imaginary of the woman is such that it allows only honor to be part of it it does not allow for the realities the practicalities the fact that a woman may want to kill herself but not be able to kill herself because the well is filled up she tries four times but when she climbs up even her son is not happy at the fact that his mother survived so the tragedy of these 
imaginaries. When you, when you keep away realities that are real, you are really committing crimes against the realities which human beings experience, which human beings go through. And therefore, the need to push the boundaries so as to allow the realities to become part of the uh, uh, part of the imaginary. Okay, now I want to, I have only about uh, five minutes. I want to move um, into uh, into what uh, Virginia Woolf had said in her room of one's own, right? And that, remember, if you remember, she is talking right at the big towards the beginning in the first few pages. She's talking about how she is, uh, 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 she, how she is relaxing uh, beside a river in this place which she names Oxbridge, by which she obviously means Oxford and Cambridge. Universities into which she had been denied uh, admission, but universities which now are inviting her to speak. And uh, uh, she says that, uh, she says that, um, uh, she finds that uh, 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 that as she is, she speaks of this trying to think of ideas in the idiom of fishing. And she says that as I lower my uh, fishing rod to the river, hoping that the fish will come and bite, ideas will come to my mind. Suddenly there is this guard who will come in and who, who chases her off the grass because you're not supposed to be on the grass. And so she quickly, you know, suddenly in, in, in nervousness because this girl guard shoes her away. She's after all a woman and he doesn't know she's Virginia Woolf, the woman. She sort of scutters, scurries away from the grass. And then she says, but that by the time I scurried away, the fish that had been biting, the ideas that had been coming to my mind, I had lost that bite for the time being. And so she tries to go to the library and she sees that the library is like a fortress, impermeable, indifferent. Something which she says is, is in stark contrast to my own vulnerability. And since she, does, she is not welcome there also, she says, never will I ask for that hospitality again. This idea of the genders occupying different spaces, this idea of the imaginary of the woman being something that is alien to the precincts of Oxbridge, the precincts of a library, all of these bring to her the need to reimagine the boundaries, the need for us to think again of these outlines, these lines which delineate the figure of the woman or the figure of the man. And in another essay, which is this essay by, uh, uh, essay which she calls uh, 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 Mr. Arnold and Mrs. Brown, she is speaking of this old woman, Mr. Brown, Mrs. Brown, who is sitting in a corner of a railway compartment. She's sitting on one side of the railway compartment and she looks that side and there's this old woman sitting on that other corner. And she tries to understand the woman. And as she tries to understand the woman, she says, that till date, all the people who have written about a person like Mrs. Brown, this woman who is sitting on the other corner, would only have seen her shabby clothes, her graying hair, her old hat, would not have spoken about what was going on inside her. It is now necessary, she says, to look inside, not at the exteriors that these writers like Mr. Arnold have been talking to us about, but rather talk of the other realities, which are also part of the realities that are inside, so that we are able to have a more complete idea of Mrs. Brown or of all uh, human beings, women. Let me read this, uh, uh, this small uh, short quotation to you from here. Uh, so to return to this Mrs. Brown, this old woman who is sitting in this corner, the simultaneously old and new character, Wolf recognizes that she would be imagined in certain ways by the established writers. Old Mrs. Brown's character, she writes, will strike you very differently according to the age and country in which you happen to be born. 
it would be easy enough to write three different versions of that incident in the train. An English version, a French version, and a Russian version. The English writer would make the old lady into a character, you know, a kapaglate, eccentric character. He would bring out her oddities, mannerisms, her buttons, her wrinkles, her ribbons, her warts. Her personality would dominate the book, this personality. A French writer would rub out all that. He would sacrifice the individual Mrs. Brown to give a more general view of human nature, to make a more abstract, proportioned, harmonious whole. The Russian, however, and she is appreciative of the Russian way of looking at things, would pierce through the flesh, would reveal the soul, the soul alone, wandering out into the Waterloo Road, asking of life some tremendous question, which would sound on and on in our ears after the book was finished. And because there would, there could be, there can be different ways of looking at this one character, Wolf is trying to sensitize us to the fact that gender needs to be looked at. Uh, a few general, uh, where are we? A few general slides as we, before I begin, I have only three or four minutes. This is therefore something that we talk of like, um, um, sorry, uh, like refraction. Okay, there is a certain reality, but because of the layers of light and because of the way in which the light strikes, light from there strikes our eyes, we see it as different. We do not see the straight line of the spoon. We do not see the girl or the boy as they are. We see the girl as the girl has been imagined for ages. Something which is not real, something which is not true. It is an erroneous representation of reality. It is not correct mimesis. It is failed mimesis, in fact, okay? We are therefore largely seen, seeing as we have been taught to see the man, okay? And Judith Butler is trying to sensitize us to the ways in which these ideas of gender have moved into our minds to take or to try to take a stable hold. This is something which we, our eyes have gone grown familiar to and you do not really see anything to be noted over there till you come into this other picture when you suddenly realize, yes, the earlier, the bus conductors have always been males. This is a change. So the need to reimagine, the need to push the boundaries so that we can understand better what the imaginary of the gender is. I think I will stop there today. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mukherjee. Uh, should I read out uh, certain questions from the participants? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Um, our HOD, Dr. Shukanta Dash, has sent in a question. He says, space as we know is gendered. The recent slogan, walk from home, has confused and complicated the so-called notions of home and the world. What is your take on it? Can we foresee any new reconfiguration? Okay, shall I answer that or would you like to? Uh, okay, let me answer that. Uh, yes, indeed. The usual, uh, the familiar divide of the private and the public, familiar divide of the home and the world, so to say, Gore Baire, has been thoroughly uh, confused in this uh, completely unforeseen scenario that we have been facing for the past few months. Uh, you ask me whether uh, there is, you see, whether I see any opportunity of uh, there being a new delineation of spaces. Not really, unfortunately. I don't see that. Uh, though, yes, we are working from home. As you can see, we are uh, working, uh, I mean, the, uh, the usual gender boundaries or the usual private public boundaries have been thoroughly blurred. But if we look at the larger picture of our society, 
uh, much of uh, the home, the work boundaries have largely remained the same. Work has simply become even more overwhelming than it had been earlier. That is the eight hour work day that had been fought for by leaders earlier has been quite wiped out. Uh, you are now expected to be, to have far larger, far longer work hours because you don't have to travel, you are at home and therefore you can always, you need more time, uh, you, are, you give more time also to the work. As far as the division between the genders, the housework between the, dip, uh, between the genders uh, is concerned, yes, we have had sharing of tasks, we have had uh, a sharing of the, uh, of the uh, homework and the, uh, the, the, uh, the domestic duties and the uh, office duties, uh, so to say. But from what I hear in, uh, in the larger sphere, uh, the housework is still being done by the women, mostly. Now, you, you, you're putting me in a slightly difficult position when you ask me that question, because as you can see, right behind me in the same room, my husband is working. So I cannot very well say that he is not sharing the housework, which he is. But from what I hear in the larger sphere of things, uh, much of the housework is still being done by women. Uh, and so, no, I do not really see uh, this COVID situation giving rise to a very different scenario in the post-COVID situation. What may change will change only for those who are already sensitive, who are already converts, so to say, who do not uh, who do not believe so much in the gender division. So people who had already been taking an active role in the housework are only taking a more active role now. I do not think people or ma males who believe that housework or domestic was, work was the women's concern totally are really taking, any, taking on much share, any share of the housework. So no, I, I'm uh, pessimistic there. I don't really see a chance for much change. Thank you, ma'am. Should I go to the next question? There are a lot coming in. Uh, how many questions uh, would you be able to answer? I will, I will be uh, free to take questions till quarter past 12, which is when I have to. Uh, okay. Okay. Because th there's, a, there's a, uh, an interesting question on Ellen Sizu. Um, this is from Hashwati Bhattacharji. Do you think that women can perceive or come closer to their inherent archetypal psyche by writing autobiographies? And can we draw this inference from what Helen Sisiu very famously said in her essay, The Laugh of Medusa, that women can connect with herself by writing? No, I'm sorry. Uh, Isha, give me that question again. I understood what she say, asked about uh, Helen Sisiu, but what, what is the first question? Part, the first okay. part. Um, uh, she says, do you think that women can perceive or come closer to their inherent archetypal psyche by writing autobiographies? This is the question. Uh, I would say uh, uh, that this is a question that is not true only about women, but about possibly all human beings in general. Increasingly, we are looking to humans as humans, not so much as man or woman. And therefore, this essentializing of the man and the woman are, I think, concepts which we now need to get out of. In fact, the very recent work on uh, gender is saying that something which all of us always knew, I guess, commonsensically, is that there is no one uh, uh, idea of woman or one idea of man, but rather that there would be a range of genders. You know, woman, more woman, less man, more man, less woman, etc. And if, if we must use the binary of woman and man, a binary which I think uh, we need to do away with now, but if we must use the, the binary of woman and man, then yes, I think all human beings are or do 
uh, or, or find it easier to be in touch with their true selves, with their inner ideas, with their inner entities through the writing of autobiographies. This is something which has been uh, uh, delved in detail uh, uh, in, uh, in the writings of uh, those, um, uh, uh, those women, I cannot remember the name of this person right now, who speaks about how the autobiography is an act of rebellion because you decide to put out your story as coming from yourself, not your story as coming from society. Both women and men are viewed by society in a certain way. When you write an autobiography, you are writing about yourself as an individual, not as part of a community of women or a community of men. So yes, I, I think this, uh, this, uh, the answer to this question would uh, be yes, except that I think the binaries of woman and man have got increasingly complicated in the last decade. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Mohua Bhomik, who asks, what is your take on Dalit women as far as this concept of girl imagined is concerned? Uh, thank you, Mohua. Um, as you know very well, no uh, clean answer to that is possible. No uh, yes or no this or that answer to that is possible. When we talk of Dalit women, we are talking of a huge variety, a diversity of spheres. Uh, education, illiteracy, poverty, privilege. It's a huge variety or a diversity of contexts that we are looking at. And therefore, we cannot really... Uh, I cannot really give any answer to that, but let me try to take your question in a generalized kind of a way. We don't usually try to, uh, we don't usually like answering in a very general universalized kind of a manner because we are always advising our students to be particular, to be specific, to uh, illustrate with examples. But if I were to speak of Dalit women uh, in, an, in a pan-Indian scenario, then I would say that the imagination, the imaginary of the Dalit women, woman is different from that, from the imaginary of the uh, upper caste women. Uh, in some ways it is more flexible, but in some ways it is also uh, far more restricted because of the lack of access to um, opportunities. But in some ways, it is far more flexible. Uh, I'm reminded of a funny story which I had heard from a friend who was working among the Satnami Christians of uh, Gujarat, I think, or Bihar. And he had said that with conversion uh, to Christianity, uh, the women of the lower castes tried to become more, uh, what shall I say, polite. Now, when they became more polite, they could no longer give the usual galis that they would earlier have given easily to their husbands. And this, this became a problem. And there were complaints from the women about how in times of, uh, uh, you know, quarrels at home, the earlier words, colorful words, which they would have used in these situations to put the man in his place and to really fight it out, were now being denied to them because they had risen sort of to the level of the upper caste women who did not usually give galis and therefore they found themselves to be somewhat weakened in the procedure. So the, the imaginaries of the Dalit woman and the upper caste women are definitely different in different ways. Thank you, ma'am. Um, yes. Just a second. Okay, uh, the next question is from, ma'am, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, the next question is from Samana Madhuri, who asks if uh, you had been influenced by Raymond Williams's definition of quote-unquote culture while interpreting the girl as someone who is always in the making from the old and the new. Uh uh, Raymond Williams, I think, is somebody I am always influenced by, not just by this. And uh, yes, definitely, 
he doesn't give you any idea uh, 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 if you're obviously talking of the new idea of culture that Raymond Williams and also uh, uh, what was the name of that other person uh, who bring in this new this wider idea of culture but no if you talk of uh, influence as far as this talk was concerned I think it would be more correct to say that Raymond Williams's concept of the structures of feeling become far more uh, relevant over here. What is the structures of feeling? Structures of feeling, Raymond Williams says, are ways of thinking into which we get conditioned. So when we feel something, we tend to categorize, to label that feeling in accordance with structures that we have been handed down. So culture, as Raymond Williams said, is a very large area, right? That is what you're saying when you speak of Raymond Williams's idea of culture, that culture is not just high culture, but culture is also what we call low culture, and therefore all kinds of songs, all kinds of entertainment, all kinds of uh, 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 drama that we had earlier pushed away as not belonging to culture are all forms of culture. That is the basis of Raymond Williams's culture and society uh, thesis. But more relevant to this talk, I think, would be the idea of his structures of feeling, because as he is saying, that because we get accustomed and trained in our minds to thinking along these structures which we have inherited as legacies, we tend to interpret and understand our feelings in accordance with those structures. Look at the reverse way in which it is happening. I feel something, but I don't recognize that feeling in the way I feel it. I recognize that feeling in the way that structure has told me to. So when I encounter something or when I have a feeling, I try to see which of the words or which of the feelings, which of the uh, ideas or ideals that we have been given, my feeling fits into two. This is, of course, if you go a little deeper, you will understand this is also the understanding of language. That if I don't have a word for it, I don't know it. If I see a color which is uh, not blue, not green, I say it is bluish green, but I don't see the new color as it exists because I don't have a word for it. So similarly, Raymond Williams is telling us that if I don't have that structure, I don't know how to talk about it. I don't know how to speak about it. To give you a very a simple example, which would be uh, immediately comprehensible to all students, it is uh, rape has become something which we are repeatedly talking about, right? And women or girls who are raped complain about it. They lodge complaints about it. When they lodge complaints or when they complain to their family members, to their parents or to their uh, sisters, brothers, friends about it, they know how to talk about it. They know what has happened. And the person to whom they are telling it to also know what has happened, what the crime is, what the punishment should be. There is therefore a structure about this discourse that is already has come about in our society. It hasn't come about automatically. It has come about through years of speaking about it, trying to speak about it, talking about it, forcefully making others listen, pushing the boundaries, so to say. But something which activists repeatedly talk to us about is about the idea of male rape. <clears throat> something, this is something which we hear about not just in the war zones, not just in the zones where there is, which are under uh, state machinery, but also for young boys. But that is a structure of discourse, of feeling, which our society is only in the process of coming to recognize. There is talk about it more and more. But so the, the injured boy or the injured man does not know how to talk about it. The idea of shame, which has, to a large extent, been taken away from the girl's rape so that the girl can say, this is a crime that has been committed against me. I'm not saying it's gone away. But to a large extent, we have been successful in doing that. But for the male rape, that has not yet, we have not yet achieved that structure of feeling. And therefore, if you talk of Raymond Williams, thank you for reminding me of Raymond Williams, it is not culture. It is the structure of feeling that I would say is far more relevant 
to understanding the girl imagined over here. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, do we have time for another question? Uh, the last question, yes. I'm okay. sorry, but I really have to go now. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is from Parash Basin. He asks, he asks about the transgender identity. He says, in any imagined community, membership to the community needs to be recognized by those who express affiliation to it and also to those at large for whom the expression is meant for. In light of growing visibility of transgender identity, how do opinion and social fact meet? The difference between one's belief in belonging to a community and being recognized by others as truly belonging to that community. How are these coinciding? Uh, this is of course a talk for a completely another 40 minutes long talk at least. Uh, very briefly, in the same ways in which membership to any community is guarded. So there are over here also gatekeepers as we have for any other community who decide what makes you fit for this community, whether you can be a member of this community or not. However, since the transgender community is still largely on the margins, the gatekeeping to that community is possibly, I, cannot, I do not claim to be an authority over here because I have not uh, studied as much as I have uh, as on other subjects as I have uh, on this subjects of the transgenders. But from my talks with friends, uh, colleagues, uh, and others, I would say that possibly because this community is still largely on the margins of mainstream society, the gatekeeping is not as harsh as or as severe as it is for those communities, the gated communities, which are established communities. Uh, I think that is the best that I can give you as answer. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, this had been an enlightening lecture. Uh, for This is for everyone. The feedback link has been posted in the chat box and you will be getting, uh, you will be getting it once you fill it out and submit it. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mukherjee. Over thank to you. Dr. Das, um, if you wish to say a few words. Uh. The only word that I can speak here is that we are extremely privileged and we feel very happy to hear such an uh, enlightening talk. So once again, from my part, uh, as well as from the department's behalf, uh, I say uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for your enlightening talk and our participants for listening to this uh, brilliant lecture. Thank you all. And we we'll see you in the next session that will start at 4.30 p.m. Another talk on women's issues. Thank you very much. Thank you all. We should be leaving very shortly. The feedback link, once again, has been posted. And fill it out and submit it if you want to get your certificate. You will be receiving only one certificate, by the way, not three for three separate sessions. Thank you. Meeting for us, Lakum, on Kodi. Mute as well. I'm meeting for us, Lakum. A meeting end for the meeting end for the hobby. Our Sharaja. Acha. 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 Feedback link to the other hours. She gets. What's up with the other? 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 Do you think me? What I will say, what the feedback link page and I guess it.
message to everyone we hope you have received the feedback links it will be it will feature in this chat group for a few minutes if you if you face any problems technical problems please contact us via the whatsapp groups or or our contact numbers available in the in the in whatsapp thank you shubhanadi মানে ঠিক আছে